Morning and welcome to Keystone Church Online. My name is Lauren Foster. This is my beautiful wife, Lauren, and we pastor here at Keystone Church. And we just wanted to take a minute to let you know what you can expect here with Church Online, if, especially if this is your first time joining us. The heart of our church is to make every person feel welcome. And so part of what you'll see this morning is a glimpse into our home because we want you to feel like you've been welcomed home into our church family. And if you're encouraged or you're a part of our church family already and you'd like to give towards supporting the vision as we advance the gospel in our community and beyond, on our website, keystonechurchpa.com, there's some different options in which you can give and support the ministry. We're so glad that you're here today and hope this message encourages you with the hope of Jesus. So we'll be wrapping up the... uh the, the, the study on the heroes of faith. And uh, over the years, growing up in a Christian home and just kind of growing up around faith, uh, Abraham kind of resonates with me quite a bit. And, and, and as I was asked to do a study on this, I thought I would go back into my childhood memories and sing that song, Father Abraham. Remember that song? Father Abraham, many, 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 and daughters, by the way, you know, they kind of back then. But, but you, it's sort of true that he is our patriarch of faith, the Judeo-Christian faith. And what I really would like us to do is to sort of uh, take a moment around what's going on in our world and, and focus on nothing but the scripture so that we get this uh, uh, armor of God around us. So before we begin, shall we go before the Lord in prayer? Father, we appreciate you for the way you father us. You are a loving dad, and we are so glad to call you Abba, Father. There's no any other father either on the earth or anywhere else who can love us the way you do. And for that, we count it a privilege and a joy. As we look into your word this morning, we want to just kind of rest in, uh, in your presence. We ask the Holy Spirit to come and just kind of illumine our hearts and our thoughts so that we may know nothing but the truth that which shall set us free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we are going to look at the book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. It's a really, really unique argument that Paul is trying to make with this seemingly uh, Jewish audience. So he's making an argument with them, but I want us to be really very specific in looking at the way he's presenting the gospel in this argument. Romans 4, verse 1 to 5. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in in this matter? If If in fact Abraham, or let me rephrase that, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. One more time, shall we pray. Father, 
illumine this word in our spirit that we may just adhere to it and uh, make it practical in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Those of you who like titles, I've titled this message, The Faith That Moves God. Uh, the story that we read is really unique, but really we got to bring it home, and we shall try to do that in the next few minutes here. Uh, several years ago, uh, I, I took a group of you, uh, teenagers, uh, myself and and for other leaders, we took a group of uh, youth, uh, I mean, teenagers from our youth group to go and see a movie in the theater. And the movie was uh, God is Not Dead. I, I don't know how many of you remember that movie. It came out around 2014 ish, somewhere in that range. The budget was proposed for $2 million, and they were able to make $62 million. In that movie, God is Not Dead. Uh, the, the idea was that the, 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 there was this sort of um, uh, approach where they wanted to portray uh, the way faith is declining in a lot of homes because of uh, a lot of teachings that are foreign to uh, the values of our Christian faith. So in the movie, uh, Joash, a young Christian who has been raised as a believer in his home, goes to college, just like most kids do, and he goes to college. The first day of class, he attends a philosophy class, uh, which is actually uh, taught by a professor, Dr. Redson, and this professor, just out of smack, he just says, today, I'm going to let you know, I want you to study these three, three words, God is dead. God is dead dead. And he said, there are no arguments because this is all that I want you to know. Because there are so many beliefs that says God is, is alive, but I want you to know that God is dead. And I think we are not too far from reality with that sort of mindset. In college environment, in the secular environment, your workplace, wherever you go, you are seeing a lot of attacks on Christianity. The recent study by um, the group, they call themselves the Pew Research Center. It's a kind of uh, a, a non-government organization. They conduct studies about different topics. And their recent study on faith uh, indicated that 8 out of 10 Americans believe that their Christian faith is declining. The faith that they learned when they were young is no longer the same faith that they have even in 2024. Now, again, these are not shocking statistics, but these are statistics that are going to be helpful for us as believers. In that same studies, uh, they indicated that, uh, this is really, really shocking to me, 41% of people who were surveyed, and this is about a population sample of 12,963 uh, respond respondents, the of those uh, 12,000 uh, respondents, 41% of them, of them said it is best to avoid discussing religion at all if someone disagrees with you. Now, this is 2024, by the way. This study was done in Fe January and February, and it came out in March. Now, the same study was done in 2019, where people's sort of tolerance to a religious discussion was about 33%. You can see it keeps going up and up, which means that the, the ideology that God is dead is infiltrating a lot of so many believers out there, and I hope it should not even be uh, in among us. We live in a fragmented world today. Our society are being shattered by these foreign ideologies where truth is relative. We, we are beginning to debate about truth. What is, is. We don't have to go back and start bringing some suppositions and finding adjective to tweak the truth of God. The truth of God has always been, and it, it is, and shall always be, 
and we have to watch out for those. There's a new movement among some circles, uh, progressive Christianity. They are entertaining the idea of uh, de deconstruction of faith, meaning that, you know what, this happened years ago. This is the 21st century. I believe God will be okay allowing some things like this to happen. Wouldn't you believe that? No, I wouldn't, because the Bible says, you know, I don't agree to that. So we have to guard our minds and our hearts from understanding the terrain, the world that we live in, and looking that to the word of God as our reference point. In our own strength, we can't. That's why that statistics, eight out of 10 Americans being asked whether faith is strong in their lives as they were when they were young, they're saying, no, it's losing ground. And I hope it's not you and I. Now, we know that the Word of God provides us with a very essential basis to counter these false ideologies that are seemingly, not even seemingly, overtly is probably the better adjective, designed to demystify, rather de designed to diminish the efficacy and actually the uh, authority of the Word of God. God's word is very authoritative, and it is very, very efficient, if you think in those terms. Now, what I really want us to also look at is how do we then look at the, the faith that we've grown up in? If you grew up in a home where faith was discussed, and it was sort of like something relatively you know, normal to you, how do you sustain that faith? Because we don't want you to reach in your, you know, adult years and begin to doubt the things you've always believed in. And here's a good way to uh, kind of make as our example, the story of Abraham. Now, remember, Abraham is not this character from a dystopian, you know, you know era. Is a human who lived just like you and I is actually the first Jewish believer to believe in Yahweh as well known in the scripture and therefore is, is denying these foreign gods. It was very common back then to have multiple gods but Abraham becomes as the first believer to believe in a monotheistic God. One God. And because of that, Abraham is accounted for his righteousness. This is our faith, brothers and sisters. Without the faith of Abraham, you and I wouldn't be congregating today. The gospel as presented by Christ Jesus would not have any significance whatsoever if Abraham in the first place didn't believe in the Lord, his God, your God, and my God as we should. The story of Abraham should resonate with all Christians through their faith. That's why sometimes you have to also come up with some Hebrew words like bokatov, you know, tov toda, shalom, y'all. In essence, you are a Jew, not by nationality, not by being in Israel, but by Abraham's descent. You are a Jew. You are a descendant of Abraham's faith. It is absolutely critical to embody that in your faith as you believe in Yeshua, the Messiah. So then, how do we believe in this God whom Abraham believed in? The Bible said Abraham believed in the Lord and it is credited for his righteousness. Now, the, the, the setting in this instance where Paul is teaching in, in Romans 4, it's coming from chapter 3 where there were a group, group of Jewish people who approached Paul and said, you know what, I'm a Jew, I believe in the law, I'm circumcised, I don't need anything else, I'm good, I got it made, I'm going to heaven. And Paul is like, you know what? The law is really good, but you're not justified by the law. You are justified by faith in the one who gives the law. Because the law is designed to provide you with morality, how to live well. It doesn't give you access to receiving Christ or to receiving a right relationship with God. 
And this is where Abraham was referenced in that way. So let's kind of look at four things. We are going to look at the core of Abraham. We are going to look at what is faith. And then we'll look at how to receive faith and how to walk by faith. Now, the core of Abraham, which is the first point. How did God call Abraham? Well, it wasn't Abraham. It was Abraham. God called Abraham because he found him to be among the faithful believers in a culture of so many uh, people who were in an apostate. They just quit believing. And Abraham was just one of the faithful. And the Lord called him in Genesis uh, chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. The Lord said to Abraham, go from the country from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation, and I'll bless you, and I'll make your name great, and you'll be a blessing, and I'll bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I'll curse, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went, and the Lord had told him, and, and, Lot with, and he brought Lot with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Aaron, which is his, uh, his, his leaving his family to go into a place where the Lord called him. What we see, the, what, what we kind of learn from the life of Abraham, three things. Number one, we see that God's calling in our lives is tied to a place. This is very significant here. I'm going to spend a little bit of time teaching and then I'll go back in some a moment of uh, expository uh, uh, preaching here in a little bit. The calling of God in your life is, and in my life is tied to a place. What do I mean by that? God called Abraham to leave his family, to leave his country. Now, country, when I was studying this, R, which is you are, if you can help me pronounce that, R is the city where Abraham was living, uh, to another place, uh, which is actually in um, where the Chaldeans lived, was about 12,000 miles in our modern day, right? 12,000 miles. So that was considered a country. Now, if you think about that, the place where Abraham grew up was so significant to him. He had friends there. He had his family, cousins, and all that. But God told him to leave that place, to go to a place where he wanted him to thrive. Our calling is tied to a place. Your place is not a mistake. Where you are, where God is taking you, it's for that reason. There's a mission tied to that. Secondly, we see that God's calling in Abraham's life is tied to a people. The people he was taking him to, this is where we find Canaan, uh, the, the, the land that was promised, and Abraham never got to enjoy all the, uh, the honey, uh, that was the milk and honey that was promised, but it was there that the Lord wanted him to go so that he could bring the word of the Lord by being faithful to the people. The last thing that we see is that God, God's calling is also tied to a promise. And that promise is extremely significant. What has God promised you? Has God brought people around you who are inspiring you to live as a believer? They are speaking the word of God into your life. And God is also reminding you of the promises he spoken to you either when you are a teenager or maybe at some point point in your walk with him, he spoke a word and you've forgotten about that word. I want you to go back and remember the promise of God. It's absolutely important to do that. How can we live like Abraham in this modern age? What we're learning about here is faith. It's not just like, you know, fairy tale stories. This is faith. Somebody day in, day out, put in an honest, hard work and believed God through it all. How can we, like Abraham, live that kind of faith? Let's first and foremost define faith. 
let's look at this uh, definition of faith. So what is faith? Point number two. Hebrews verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 1 to 2, and then 6 and 8 gives us a pretty good uh, framework for defining faith. Hebrews 11, this is what it says. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. I would underline those things. This is what the ancients were commended for. And verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's another place to underline. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Abraham, when caught to go to a place he would later rest, receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Wow. True story. I didn't want to do this, but I got to put it in there because I, my mind took me there. When I was planning, planning to come to the United States, the college I was applying to, Geneva College, it took five years to, to be corresponding by mail. I had to write letters with a pen put it in the envelope, lick the, the, lick the envelope. Hopefully the DNA stays there so that they know I wrote it. Put it in the mail. Five years corresponding back and forth. When they answered 2006, I was praying and fasting and the Lord led me to this story. I was shaking in my boots. I remember exactly where I was. I remember as, as, as clear as day. The Lord just showed me the story of Abraham. Now, I'm not a faithful person, at least you know. I'm, 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 I'm trying my best to live exactly to what God has called me to do. But I remember crying before the Lord, Lord, I need you now more than ever. I'm not going to make it going to the United States. I have no relatives there. I know nobody there. The Lord says, all is well. All is well. And I can tell you, all has been well. And it shall be well. Here's what I learned. Thank you. Here's what I learned. Faith is complete trust in God that he will sustain you. How about that? Have you ever dared to trust God at that level? Gutsy trust? Like ridiculous trust? Like, I'm going to trust in you, God, no matter what. I know it hurts, but I'm going to trust in you. Second thing we look at faith is remembering God's promises. Remember that, those promises? Abraham didn't leave any chance to forget what God had promised him. This is guy who's 75 years old. He has no child. And the Lord says, you'll be a father to many nations. Actually, in Genesis chapter 15, verse, verse 1 and 6, you see a beautiful story. The Lord takes Abraham in the dark and says, hey, can you see how beautiful the sky looks today? Abraham said, tonight, Abraham said, yeah, yeah, I see. It looks kind of pretty nice. I said, what do you see? Abraham said, yeah, I guess I see stars. He's like, yeah, you see stars? He's like, yeah, he's like, that's how many your sons and daughters will be on the earth. Abraham looked and said, Lord, are you kidding me? I'm 75 years old. <laughs> you know, so, so, so you know, to be able to take God from that viewpoint and still believe that he promised that I'll be a father to many nations, even to his dying day. And here we are. Father Abraham, yeah. we got to have to have the reliance on God's credibility. What Abraham did was he took God at his word. God does not lie. Let every man be a liar, but God be true. That's what the Bible says. Faith does not deny present circumstances, but yet trust in the promises of God. I don't mean to say, hey, I'm not going to, 
I'm not going to just, you know what, I'm not going to be in denial. I'm going to look at what's happening. I'm like, this is happening. But you know what? I know who's great. I know somebody who's greater than what's happening right now. I remember this is back in Africa, praying for this woman. And I hope we don't ever reach to that point. Uh, and I know it's our faith and God help us. I, I remember praying for this woman who went to my church back then. And she was literally dying of a, an illness that the medical profession could have cured. And she said, I don't take medicine. I don't believe in anything but God. I wrestled with that. Because every single day, I, I mean, back in Africa, you, you, you have to rely on nothing but prayer. She didn't have food in her house, so I would take a little bit of porridge. That's a British term. I'll make porridge. And my mom is like, why are you taking that porridge? I'm like, i got to take to somebody who needs it. So I'll take a little porridge, and, and I go to a side bed, and I'll kneel, praying, praying that God would perform a miracle. And I'll give her a little bit of that and, and, and in a home. And when she passed, I, I said, God, it's not that you didn't care for this woman, but this woman didn't have faith in you and the people around her. The doctors are there to provide us with a cure. Our present circumstances is not going to be a delimiter or a dictator of whether we got to put our, uh, whether our circumstance is, is not going to change, but it's going to change even by God working through those medical professionals whom he has trained. God does not, I mean, uh, faith does not deny present circumstance, but puts hope in God, puts its trust in God. The third point, how do we receive faith? So now we know that faith comes from hearing, that is hearing the good news about Christ. This is Romans chapter 10, verse 17. How do we then receive this faith? Faith is not something that is static. I'm going to repeat that. Faith is not static. You can't just receive faith and say, oh, you know, I put it in the bank. It's safe, you know. No, no, it's okay. It's in the savings. Got it. Got it. Got it when I was in Sunday school. It's, it's doing okay. You know, every, every day I check on it. Faith is okay. No. No. No and no. Faith has to be exercised, has to grow. It is like one of those classic pants that I like anymore. You go to buy pants. Do you know what they say? <laughs> Four-way stretch. I love that. I love them pants, you know. They stretch with you. That's how faith is. You got to have the capacity to stretch believing in God. We receive faith by through the word of God. That's the way we receive faith. Reading the word. That's why I'm happy about the next study. How to study the Bible. Just spending time in the word. That's how we receive faith. Uh, Psalms 119 says this. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How about that? Good stuff. We receive faith by spending time with God. That's kind of normal. That's why it's so good when we come to church, because guess what? There's so much tangible presence of the Lord. When we spend time with God, we know that he's going to hear us and he's going to receive our supplications. Psalms, one, uh, Psalms 27 verse 4 says this thing, One thing I ask from the Lord, this is what I do seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. That's, that's just exactly that. Faith is spending quality time with God. Faith is how we grow as believers. We receive faith when we also fellowship with one another. That's why coming to church is very critical. To be honest, when I'm on vacation, which I love going on vacation, you know, Sunday comes around, I, I feel guilty being on the beach. 
Because it's not normal. How many days in my life if I just, oh, right, son, I'm going to roll around, do nothing? Very few. Even when, and I know that's sort of not a bragging right to say, uh, because sometimes we've gone away from faith and come around, and, and whatever you did back then, you still would feel that void. Because guess what? We were made to worship God. We receive faith when we fellowship with other believers. Be engaged. Be in a small group, life group. Be with friends who speak the same word. How do we walk by faith? This is my last point, and then we'll be closing. How do we walk by faith? Matthew 17, verse 20, Jesus replied, because you have, little, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it shall move. Nothing will be impossible for you. He's teaching about faith. And this is a story when Peter saw Jesus coming on the, on the, on the lake. And Peter says, hey, command me to come over there. And Peter started walking towards Jesus. And slowly, Peter started to sink. And Jesus rebuked him and the disciples say. Your faith became little because when you saw me, I commanded you to walk. You, you were walking on the water, but the sooner you started uh, uh, disbelieving, you started to sink. Faith is always believing in God. So how do we walk by faith? Number one, we acknowledge our dependence on God. You've heard the statistics that people live in third world countries. People live on one, less than one dollar a day. My family lived on that for a while. Less than one dollar a day. You start praying for your meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You've got to be praying for that. Absolute dependence on God. There is nothing. Nothing else. And we need that kind of tenacity towards believing God. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Number three, maintain a grateful heart. As a faith builder, gratitude is the way the Lord shapes our heart to be humble. Gratitude is the way the Lord shapes our hearts to be humble. Show me a grateful person, and I'll show you a blessed person in a lot of ways. Last point. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We can't live our lives in this world with all that's going on. There's so much things that are going on that are crashing in on everyone, more also even on believers without faith. We got to have that faith in us to know that no matter what, I'll keep my eyes on the prize, and that's Jesus Christ. Here's what another scholar stated, and I'll end on this note. This is what C.S. Lewis stated. The promise of glory is the promise, almost incredible, and only possible by the works of Christ, that some of us, that any of us who really chooses shall actually survive that examination and shall find approval, shall please, please God, to please God, to be real, to be a real ingredient in the divine happiness, to be loved by God and not merely repeated, but delighted in as, a, as an artist delights in his work or as a son, it seems impossible a weight or a burden of glory which our thoughts can hardly sustain, but so it is. 
This is from the weight of glory. Can you see the picture here? C.S. Lewis is portraying that our hope is anchored in that eternal perspective. That we want to be there. What we see on earth is transient. Therefore, we anchor our faith with the view that one day he's coming. And so he shall. As we come to the close, if you're in here, you don't know Jesus Christ, this message is not going to have any effect on you. I want to remind us that God is faithful to receive us just the way we are. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, Here I am, stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him. And Hebrews says, today, if you hear his word, do not harden your heart. Would you please consider accepting Christ as your Savior? Because if you don't know him, your faith is, there's, there's nothing to it. We have to focus on who Christ is to first even believe in him. We have to know him first. And I want to say, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, I'll be glad to pray with you, just like I did. And I still do. Because I found out that that's the only way I can stretch my faith, just like my pants, when they are stretched around my waist, can sustain me. Can you do that for us? Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We love your word. We are not always righteous people. Our righteousness as filthy rags as indicated. But only in you do we found loved. Only in you are we declared the righteousness of God. I want to pray for those who, want, who, who, who really are considering to receiving you as their personal savior. If you are in here, you want to Accept Christ as your personal Savior. I want to pray this simple prayer with you. And it's not about the prayer. It's your faith in God that's going to help and sustain you. Say this prayer with me. Dear God, I come to you today. I know that I'm a sinner. I want to believe today that only you can make me whole. I receive you, Christ, as my Lord and Savior. Come transform me and make me new. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's give a hand to Christ, folks.